right, good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody here. My name is Brian Mosley, in case I haven't had a chance to introduce myself to you before. Uh, but I serve as the lead pastor here at the Springs, and I'm excited that each of you are here today. Thank you so much for choosing to spend some time here with us today. Today, I want to talk to you specifically about this idea, this message of owning the vision. All right, would you say that with me here? Let's own the vision. All right, one more time. Own the vision. I'm absolutely thrilled and excited to share this kind of message with you. It's going to be a little bit different than the kind of messages I usually share with you, but because this is going to be, it's very personal to me. I believe in the mission and the vision of the local church with all my heart, and I'm extremely passionate about it. And I'm excited about it because there is tremendous potential that this church has for the kingdom of God. There is tremendous potential for us, for us as individuals, us as families, and us corporately to be all that God wants us to be and to do all that God wants us to do. And here, here's one thing I know about the church, is that we have been planted specifically here in northwest Las Vegas on purpose for a purpose. God has strategically placed us exactly where we are, and we are here not by accident, right? We are not here by accident, and God has given us a vision for kingdom ministry. And not only do I know that about the church, but I know this about each of you. Think about this. You have been planted here in Las Vegas, right? You have been planted here on purpose for a purpose. Now I'm talking about you and me and your family. You have been planted here. God has strategically placed you exactly where he wants you to be. And my friends, we are not here on accident. <clears throat> accident. We have been given a vision. We have a vision, whether we realize it or not. Listen, God has a vision for you. He has a vision for your life, for your family. And guess what? It's good. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. I want you to look at this first uh, verse. Uh, follow along with us in your uh, message notes uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to um, <clears throat> follow the scriptures. It says this. This is from uh, the message paraphrase in Proverbs 29. It says, if people can't see, underline those words, can't see, what God is doing, what do they do? They stumble all over themselves. But when... Look at this. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. I don't know about you, but I want to I have a greater ability to see what God is up to. And when I see that, I want to join him in what he's blessing. I don't want to be on the other way around and just be asking God to bless me. No, I want to see what he's doing, and I want to jump in to his purposes, to his plans. And I want to be a person who attends. What does it mean to attend? It means to, to, to pay special attention to. So we need to attend, to pay special attention to what God is saying, what God is doing, what God is revealing. And the, and the result is that blessing. We will be blessed. Anybody want to be blessed by God in the house. I do too. So for the next few weeks, I want us to really see what God is doing. I want us to just take some time and talk about that. I want us to slow down a little bit and just really attend to what God is revealing. And, and I believe that God's blessing will be uh, given to us as a result. So I want to just take some time now and share some wins with you. I want, to, I want you to think about all that God is doing in and through our church. For example, every weekend we gather here to worship and change, change lives happen as a result of being in God's presence. And as a result of hearing the word of God preached. This year alone, more than 85 people have made decisions for Christ through this 
local church. I mean, the first time decision or a rededication decision, I mean, that is huge. And that is something that we should be celebrating because God has a plan for us. And he wants to see people saved. Amen? The second thing I want you to think about is about 100 people from our congregation regularly attend one of our small groups. And as you know, if you've been here a while, that life groups are a place where, where, where you can receive encouragement and support. And it's a life-giving place. It's where people uh, know your name and care about the things that are going on in your life. They study the scripture together. They pray together. Life groups are so, so important. And over 100 people are already connected. In life groups, that's so important. So also we think about our growth track. It's something that we do every other month now to help people discover what following Jesus looks like, what it looks like to connect to the church, what it looks like to discover their purpose and begin serving and making a, dif a difference. Excuse me. So, so far this year, 26 people have participated fully in that growth track. And, and even this month, we've had uh, probably a dozen people, one of the largest classes we've ever, ever had in our, in our growth track going through currently. So why am I telling you this? It's because God is up to something good in this church. And presently, more than 85 people serve in some capacity, one way or another, on our dream team. And these people not only have discovered their gifts and their passions and their talents from the Lord, but they're also actively serving in all kinds of different capacities. Now, when I think about those things, I get excited because this is what God is doing. I just want us to see for a minute the magnitude, the importance, the greatness of the things that God is doing through our local church. And this is not even to mention that we've, we've experienced a very successful merger with the, with the uh, Deep Roots congregation uh, at the beginning of January, uh, Jan January of last year. This is not to mention the life-changing, marriage-enriching seminar that we just had with, uh, with our overseer, Mike Chapman, here. This is not to mention all the new people and all the new families and, hello, all the new babies uh, that are coming to our church. I heard that last week and the week before we had like 11 or 12 people stuffed in that little nursery room. And like most of them were, were wonderful crying babies, right? Uh, but that's a good thing, right? It is a great problem to have. And it gives us a picture of all that God is doing in our church and in our lives. And let me just tell you this. One of my constant prayers as a pastor is this. Lord, I know that we as a church are on a journey with you. And please, Lord, let me know where you want to take us next. God's always got more in store. He's always got a greater impact plan for us, and I want to know from his heart where he's leading us to next. And I want you to just see this. So we're talking about vision. We're talking about owning the vision this morning, okay? We have a vision to continue to build our dream team. We have been, we've been highlighting different uh, parts of our dream team. We highlighted the facilities team this morning. I want you to know that it's God's plan. It's God's vision to continue to build that dream team, because we want to do this thing called church together. Amen. We are the body of Christ. The church is not meant to be a one man show. Amen. Hello. We need to be doing church together with other people, linking arms for the advancement of the kingdom. So we have a vision that God's given us also for, to add a second service. We've been talking a little bit about that. It's a dream that God has put in our hearts as a leadership team just to expand our capacity to reach more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a vision to multiply our life groups. Right now we have about 10. Wouldn't it be awesome next life group semester to have 15 and then the next semester to have 20 and, and just keep multiplying those groups because we need more capacity. We need more space to make a bigger difference in the lives of people. We have a vision for student ministry. 
I want you to think about this. From middle schoolers and high schoolers, wouldn't it be amazing to have a Wednesday night worship service just for students? To have multiple life groups for students to connect and hear the word of God. Wouldn't it be awesome to also, God has a vision for uh, more increased outreach efforts into our community to serve in different ways, to serve uh, the homeless, to serve in Operation Christmas Child, doing those shoe boxes that's coming up soon, and, um, and doing marriage ministry and all kinds of different outreach ministries. So the point is, God has big plans for us. He has a big vision for us. I just want you to see that. I want to, I want to help our, our, uh, our uh, thinking be expanded and to see how much God wants to do in and through our local church. And not only through our local church, through you, through your life, through your family, through your team. So if we were sitting down, we were having coffee, and, and you were to ask me, well, Brian, what's the, what's the core mission of, of our church? What are we all about? And I would tell you these four things, okay? This is in your notes, so jot this down, these four things. So the first one is this, know God. This is, a, this is one of the most important, the most important thing. We want people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and obey the gospel to receive salvation. We want people to be introduced to the reality of who God is. And it's not about religion. Amen. It's about having a personal relationship with God. That's the first part of our our mission and vision around here. Know God. The second part is this. Jot this down. Find freedom. Find freedom. You think about our own lives, and we all have things from the past. We all have wounds and issues and things that need to be settled once and for all. And I believe firmly, I've experienced it in my own life, that God's process for us to experience freedom from yesterday is to have the right people in our lives. To have the right people to study the word of God with. To have the right people surrounding us and speaking into our lives and praying with us. People that we can do life with together. Find freedom. The third thing I believe is a part of our core purpose is this. Discover purpose. Okay? So know God. Find freedom. And now discover purpose. One of the things that absolutely breaks my heart is that there's a stat out that says 87% of the body of Christ does not understand their purpose. That means, can you imagine, there's a, like a human body, if 80, 87% of your body doesn't know why it's there, it doesn't, it doesn't know its function, doesn't know its place, you'd be walking around like this with, with no coordination, no meaning, no purpose, no alignment, none of that. But th- that is not God's plan. God wants us, God wants his body to understand that they're here for a purpose. And that he has designed us in a particular way. And our design helps to reveal our destiny. We have to be understanding why we are here. And the, the most important part of God's plan and, and in your, your life will never make sense until you understand God's purpose for you, for you. When you understand his purpose and you begin to walk that out, you will experience something called fulfillment. Fulfillment from God's hand. And this is the last part. It's make a difference. And this is, this is what God wants. This is the goal. He wants, he wants us to know him personally. He wants us to be free in him. He wants us to have our past settled so that we can walk confidently into our future. He wants us to know our purpose. And he wants us to make a difference in the lives of other people. People. So if that's if we're having a conversation at Starbucks and, and you say, Pastor, what is your mission and vision of this church? It's wrapped up in those four elements right there. And I'm inviting you today. All of us, whether this is your first time here, you're getting a sneak preview into the mission and vision of our church. If you're a regular attender here, I'm inviting you to own it. I'm inviting that I'm inviting you to make that vision for ministry your vision and to say pastor I am on board 
I am 100%. I am all in. I got two feet in. I want to help people of this world to know God, to find freedom, to discover purpose, and to make a difference. And I am, I am, I am committed to doing that here through this church. One of the things that uh, I like to share with people, it's, uh, I put it on our website and I put it up here uh, for us to read together. I want you to hear my heart in this as I think about what kind of church we want to we be, okay? Think about this. We hope to become the kind of church described in the Bible where there's relevant teaching, there's heartfelt worship, there's honest friendships, there's constant prayer, there's compassionate care for those in need. We like to have the kind of contagious Christianity that can influence and encourage an entire community one life at a time. That's the heart. That's the vision. That's what we want to be as a church. I'm, I want to be those contagious Christians where people are like, wow, something's going on with those people. There is life happening at that church. Man, the Holy Spirit is moving and operating in a powerful way in that church, and I want to be a part of it. That's the kind of group of people, that's the kind of church that can really influence and turn a community upside down. And let me tell you something, and this is just from my heart. Ashley and I didn't come all the way from Tennessee to Las Vegas just to play church, right? We have a mission, we have a vision, we have a purpose for being here. And I'm grateful for all that God has been doing at our church, but I've got to tell you, I am not content. As long as there are people in our community who do not know the Lord, I am not going to stop. As long as there are people who, who are bound by sin and strongholds of the enemy, we're not going to slow down. We've got to continue on to advance the cause of Christ and to advance the mission of the kingdom of God in our community. Amen? Man, that was really weak. Come on, somebody. Say praise the Lord. <laughs> Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. No message about the mission and vision of God's church is complete without looking at these verses right here. <clears throat> the disciples had just spent three and a half years with Jesus. They saw, they saw mind-blowing miracles. I'm just setting the context for you. They heard life-changing messages and parables and lessons from Jesus himself. I think about it, it must have been like trying to drink from a water hose. I mean, trying to, I mean, uh, uh, a, uh, what's it called? A fire hydrant. Trying to drink from a fire hydrant. Thank you, Kevin, for helping me out there. Um, <clears throat> trying to absorb everything that Jesus was teaching and doing in our lives. And how can you remember it all? And, and what stands out when everything you've experienced is life-changing? When everything you've experienced is revolutionary. How can you remember it all? Uh, but obviously the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus changed absolutely everything. And the, the, think about this, the euphoria of seeing Jesus triumph over death must have caused these disciples to look at their experiences with him over these last three and a half years in a whole new way. Just simply infused Every post-resurrection experience with Jesus uh, with, with incredible significance. So think about this. We, th we look at Matthew's gospel. It documents all of Matthew's experiences as a disciple. How he was called, how he observed the, the ministry of Jesus and all of these things. And, and he ends this story of Christ's ministry and Christ's crucifixion and resurrection by focusing on this, this one big call to action. We call it commonly the Great Commission. 
In other words, these are the, this is the thing that Jesus said, I'm leaving you now, but I'm giving you something to do. I'm giving you an action. I'm giving you marching orders. So Christians, here's what you're to do. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 28. I'm just going to break this down for us. Matthew 28, verse 18, it said, Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Think about that for just a second. Jesus has all the authority on heaven and on earth. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus has the authority to serve as a mediator between humankind and God. Jesus has the authority to send the Holy Spirit. He has the authority to open the hearts and the minds of the people. He has the authority to reveal the Father. He has the authority to give eternal life to whom he chooses. He has the authority even to raise us up on that last day when he returns. Jesus indeed has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And then he says this, and this is the important part. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, I've been given all this authority, and by that authority, I'm telling you, you got to go. This is your mission. This is your marching order. You got to go now and make disciples of all nations of the world. I mean, think about it. Jesus's words here mean something more than just simple evangelism. It means something more than just making converts. The disciples just couldn't go out and, and make new Christians. No, they had to do something more. They had to make disciples. They had to be people who invest time, who invest energy, who invest resources into disciple making. If the church was going to, to spread, it required more than just converts. It required people who have been converted, people who have been made new by their belief in Jesus Christ. But it requires a, a, a growth. It requires a maturity. It requires a depth of people. So it's not go out and make converts. No, it's go out and spend your time, your effort, your money, all your resources and make disciples. Make disciples disciples. And the truth is, disciple-making isn't about filling up churches, right? Think, think about this. Just, just because a person goes to church does not make them a Christian. Just because a, 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 a something is in the garage does not make it an automobile, right? So you have to think about this. What, what is discipling people all about? What is this making disciples all about. It's about helping people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's about people, thank you, Selena, for that, uh, that encouragement. It's about helping people to know God. It's about helping people to find freedom. It's about helping people to discover their God given purpose. It's about helping people to make a difference. This is the very heart of what it means to make disciples, and it is the very heart of the vision of this church. And I'm going to ask you again, will you own it with me? Will you own it with me? He goes on to say this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know what baptism is all about? Baptism is about going public with your faith in Jesus, and it's communicating to everyone in the world your heartfelt commitment to following him, and it is the absolute next step after salvation. So let me encourage all of you here today, if you have not been baptized since you believe, sign up on your connection card, okay? Baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. It's a public declaration that, hey, Jesus Christ is now my Lord, he is my Savior, and he has completely transformed my life. That's the joy of baptism. And I love baptism days around here. Nothing better. And he goes on to say this, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. 
Teaching is an absolute essential when it comes to making disciples. Teaching the Word of God. This is why we print out uh, sermon notes every, every Sunday so that you can take notes. And I encourage you, even if you're not taking notes, jot this down, right? It's because you need to learn. We need to learn the Word of God. And this is why we encourage you, go to your life groups and go with your Bible and go with a plan and with an intent to actually learn something and apply it to your life and grow in your obedience to God. One thing that's important in this verse right here, it doesn't just say teaching them, right? It doesn't just say teaching them mentally. No, it says teaching them to obey, right? Teaching them to obey. That means teaching them to actually apply what they have been learning. James says, don't be, don't be deceived, right? Don't deceive yourselves. Because you should not just hear the word of God. No, you should do what it says. The power is in the application of the teaching. And he goes on to say this. This is powerful. And surely I am with you always. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, saying this at the tail end of the Great Commission. But he says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And to me, there's no greater encouragement. There's no greater comfort as a minister of the gospel than, than these words right here, where Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always be right beside you. In fact, he dwells within me. And he leads me into all truth. And he empowers me to do the work of God. And when he, he you, it makes me think of the 23rd Psalm. When, they, when he says, yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. And Jesus says, surely I will always be with you to the very end. I'll be with you. <clears throat> These words must have been incredibly significant to the disciples. After everything that they had heard in the last three and a half years, and Jesus leaves them with, with the great commission, this final call to action. Everything has been in preparation for this powerful commissioning of the disciples. And we have to understand that that commissioning was not only for them, it is also for each one of us. Amen? You guys okay? You still following with me? Okay. I told you I'm a little bit passionate about this. <clears throat> Hudson Taylor, a uh, powerful missionary to the nation of China, said this about the Great Commission. He said, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. So what's the mission and vision of our church? It's to make disciples. It's to help people to know God, to find freedom, to discover their purpose, to make a difference. And it's not an option for us. It's a command for us. Look at the scripture in Matthew 24, verse 14. It says this, and this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, comma, then look at these words, and then the end will come. How many of you guys know that the end is, is near? I mean, you can look at the news, you can listen to the stories, you can see the prophecies of the Bible being fulfilled time after time after time. The end is drawing near. But let me ask you a question. Has the end come yet? Has it happened yet? Okay, so according to this verse, then we've still got some preaching to do. Then we've still got some people to reach then we've still got some disciples to make and the church still has some work to do because the end has not come yet. So I'm inviting you today and I've been praying all week as I've just prepared for this message. Will you own the vision with me? <clears throat> I'm grateful 
for where we are as a church, as I told you earlier. But I'm definitely not content because God is leading us into more. And as long as there are hundreds and thousands of people in this city, in our community, who do not know God, I got to tell you, church, I'm not okay with it. I'm not okay with it. We've got more work to do. We've got more preaching of the gospel to do. And church, I just want to encourage you, we're just getting started. We're just getting started, and there's a lot of at stake. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm not slowing down. I may be 40 now, but I'm not going to slow down. I may have to wear glasses in the pulpit, but I'm not going to slow down. I'm not going to give up, and I'm going to continue on with a stronger sense of prayerful urgency than I've ever had before because we've got work to do. So let me ask you a question again. Will you own the vision with me? There's a verse that um, the Lord gave me this week. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. And I feel like this is for somebody here this morning. Where it says this, I tell you, now, everybody say now. now. Now is the time of God's favor. Now, everybody say now again. Now, now is the day of salvation. I want you to think about something for a moment because I've, I think about my own life, and some pivotal, important moments in my own journey with the Lord. Some of the most important moments in my life have, have been because I received a, a nudge from God through another person. Okay, Now, how many of you know we can receive a nudge from God just by His Spirit living within us, but we can also receive a nudge from God by another person. <clears throat> Brian, I've been told before, you've got a call on your life and you are dragging your feet. Let me encourage you. Get serious about the call of God. I'm going to take your hand. Somebody has spoken those words to me and it was an important and a pivotal moment and God used those words to impact my life greatly. Brian, I can see that you're slacking off in your prayer life. I can see that you're slacking off a little bit in your Bible study. Why don't we be accountability partners? Why don't we, why don't we go to this together? And why don't we hold each other accountable and go deeper in our spiritual disciplines? What was that? That was a nudge from God through another person. Brian, you're with you're an introvert, Brian. I see that. But you're withdrawing a little bit too much and you're becoming a little bit too isolated. And I want to encourage you. Let's just go out and focus on building some relationships, some healthy relationships with other people, with other leaders in the community. What was that? That was a nudge. And that was God saying to me, "Watch out." Take your next step. Do what I'm calling you to do. Brian, you and Ashley seem to be having a little bit of uh, marital tension lately. And I've noticed it. So why don't we grab some coffee and so let's talk about it together because I want to encourage you. These are words from God that nudge us in the right direction if we will receive them with humility. Brian, you look a little tired. You look a little worn out. You sound a little uh, uh, cruddy. You guys, you've been coughing a lot. Well, how about, how, why don't you think, Brian, about a couple weeks in Hawaii? Okay, somebody say amen to that. All right. Okay. Now, I received that as a word from God. All right. So. But listen, some, some of the most important and pivotal moments in my life have been because I received a nudge from God through another person. So, church, you love me, don't you? Okay. Would you allow me to be that person for just a minute? Would you allow God to nudge you a little bit through me? Because maybe it's time. The, the verse that we read 
they said, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And maybe you're here today, and maybe now is the time. This is number one on your sermon notes, if you're taking notes on the back. Is maybe it's time for you to commit your whole life to God. Maybe it's time. Maybe you've been doing this uh, church thing and just going through the motions, but you've never given your whole life, your whole heart, to following after Him. Maybe today is your day. And maybe God is nudging you through this preacher and saying, today is the day to give everything to Him. <clears throat> look at what it says in Jeremiah, thir- uh, Jeremiah 29. It says, if you look for me, what? Wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will, look at, look at this, I will end your captivity In other words, I'll bring freedom into your life and I will restore your fortunes. In other words, I will bring freedom and prosperity back into your life when you seek me with everything that you've got. What does that look like? It looks like this. Surrender the control of your life to Jesus. Make your relationship with God public. Through water baptism. Number two is this. Maybe for you, it's time to receive a nudge from the Lord to make a commitment to surround yourself with the right relationships. How many of you know the wrong relationships can influence you dramatically? You see, your, you see, show me your friends and I'll show you a glimpse of your future. Okay, sometimes we have relationships in our lives that need to be severed, that need to be cut off. Sometimes we have other relationships in our lives that need to be strengthened. <clears throat> so maybe it's time for you to surround yourself with the right relationships. Look at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. It says this, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. What's that saying? Surround yourself with the right people. Surround yourself with healthy relationships. And my encouragement always to you is join a group. Join a life group. Get plugged in. Get connected to healthy relationships. And start growing in your faith. Start growing in a healthy way with other people. Number three is this, because maybe it's time for you to start thinking about and discovering your God-given purpose. Maybe it's time for you. Maybe today is a nudge for you to start thinking about why are you here? How are you serving? How are you making a difference in this world? Look at Psalm 139. It says this, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained, did you know that your days are ordained? All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. In other words, God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. Have you discovered that yet? Have you been thinking about that? Have you been praying about that yet? Look at Ephesians chapter 20. I mean, chapter 2, verse 10. It says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus. Why? To do... What's it say? To do... To sit in the chairs every week? Oh, is that what... They didn't say that, did it? Okay. To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, there is a purpose for you before you. And God said, I need something to get done on this earth, and so I'm creating this person. Because I've got a plan for them. I've got a purpose for them. And I've got some good works for them to walk into. If you're looking for an action step for this, make sure that you've, you've completed, you've attended our growth track. Attend the four-part 
growth track. The growth track simply is just a catalyst to help you get started. Okay? Attend that growth track. Sign up on your connection card. Fourthly and finally, maybe it's time for you to start living your life doing something that matters. Look at Psalm 90, verse 12. It's a powerful prayer. It says, teach us to remember our days and to recognize how few they are and help us to spend them as we should. In other words, the Lord's encouraging us, be careful how you're spending your time and invest your time, invest your energy, invest your resources into the things that matter. What are the things that matter? I can think of three. God matters. Our relationship with him and his kingdom. What does the Bible say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things that, that concern us will be added unto us. What is it that matters? It's God and his kingdom. Second thing I can think of is people. People matter. People matter to God. They should matter to us. People matter. And the third thing is this. Eternity matters. Eternity is long. <laughs> <clears throat> eternity matters. I know that was a groundbreaking revelation for us this morning. But eternity matters. This life is like a vapor, right? It's like a mist. It appears for a moment and then it's gone. But what lasts is eternity. What's important is God and his kingdom. What's important are people. What's important is eternity. Amen? <clears throat> Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we thank you for nudging us. Thank you for speaking to us, God. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand your heart for the mission and vision of, of your church. And I pray today for my friends, my brothers and sisters, everyone who's here under the sound of my voice. Today, Father, I pray that you would speak to them and help them to understand that this is your heart for our church and that you're not done with this church yet. You're not done with them yet. You're not done with their family yet, but you have called us to greater things. You have called us to make a difference in this land, in this community, and you have called us to be servant-hearted, to be people who are passionate about the mission and vision of your church. Father, I pray that you would help us to know and understand and obey the Great Commission. Father, help us to understand how important it is to make disciples. And that, Lord, when the, when the message of the gospel is, is proclaimed in all the nations, then the end will come. But until the end comes, God, help us to be a people who are tirelessly working to advance your kingdom. Help us, God, to be a people who give generously into your kingdom. Help us to be a people who serve and serve sacrificially into, your, into the advancement of your kingdom. Because, God, we want to see people come to know you. And we want to see people experience freedom in Christ. And we want to ex see people discover their God-given purpose. And we all, God, as your children, want to make a difference. So, Father, help us today. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Everybody said... Amen. Would you stand with me, please?